captions are available for this video and full transcripts can be found on our blog. Hi, I'm Heidi Sass and I live in the Washington DC area. I'm a member of the community, the Data Collaboration Alliance. Welcome to the Data Drop panel. Each month we gather some leading data and privacy professionals to hear about the news stories that stood out for them over the past month or so. And in the fast paced world of data privacy, it's always interesting to hear what's raising the eyebrows and curling the fists of the practitioners. I should note that all of the stories that we'll feature today have been included in our podcast, which delivers a five minute privacy news roundup every other week. This month on the Data Drop panel, we have three guests, Cat Code, data privacy consultant and data privacy officer at Binary Tattoo. We have Jeff Jokish, who is CEO of Privacy Plan. And we have Chris McClellan, Director of Operations at the Data Collaboration Alliance. And we're gonna get started on talking about uh, the first article with CAT, Google Analytics to stop logging IP addresses and sunset old versions in privacy standards overhaul. What are your thoughts on that, CAT? Oh, so I was here a few months ago talking about Google Analytics, and now we are back talking about Google Analytics. Uh, there were some data protection agencies in Europe that had come down and said, we do not want to use Google Analytics in Europe anymore because they are taking private information and shipping it over to the US. And for people that are unfamiliar, there's always been a little bit of a contention with the IP address. And is it personal information or is it not? Is it personal information if it's combined with other information? So because Google does not want to lose their foothold in the world, they are removing the IP address from Google Analytics. They are sunsetting the tool that we all know as um, Universal Analytics, which I didn't know that's what it was called, but apparently it is. And they are moving to uh, GA4, which is Google Analytics 4, which has all sorts of privacy and security embedded in it so that companies can continue to use the analytics information and not breach the regulations. It's Google, poor old Google Analytics, right? It had a pretty peaceful existence for 20 years or so. <laughs> Suddenly it's uh, political football, um, I guess. Kat, so this this came out of uh, something, you know, the the Privacy Shield review and the Schrems uh, lawsuits. I think it was in um, Austria and France were the countries that uh, raised the alarm bells first and <laughs> declared Google Analytics is counter to GDPR, therefore potentially illegal, I guess. Yeah, and even right down to the location. I mean, when we we all talk about data um, and privacy by design, we always talk about obfuscating data and, and not collecting spe specific data that you don't need. So they are finally using their what they're calling data-driven attribution modeling um, to determine general locations and not actually specific locations, which again, privacy by design is what they should have been doing probably from the beginning. I, I think that the important thing here is to understand that, that, that uh, what this means is that marketers can't track your location is easily, right? And they also can't uh, connect you across devices as easily. And that's really what they're most concerned about. Um, and, you know, location data is probably one of the most mm, sensitive pieces of information about you. And while IP address is not directly your location, it, it's very much in, indirectly your location. Um, it can be inferred um, very very easily uh, in, in many, many cases. Yeah, I read the uh, sort of the summary of the, the court's decision, which was like, it's just too easy to re-identify someone with that information and all the other stuff in Google Analytics. And therefore, when that, when that data re reappears in the United States, if you're a US-based uh, website uh, publisher, then pot potentially, because Google falls under a certain act, that data could be subpoenaed or requested, right? And, um, and that, that's the big fear there. I, I was asked to provide some commentary on what US organizations ought to do about this or US-based website publishers. And I sort of broke it into two halves. One was like, look into how you're managing your data pipelines today. Look into uh, privacy-enabling technologies that might be able to to minimize and anonymize and just generally be a better curator of data. But, but uh, being from the Data Collaboration Alliance, I was also, of course, had to say that thinking long-term, this is just the thin edge of a wedge. And you need to start really thinking about uh, how you're building and buying new technology because silos and copies are the enemies of control. And uh, this problem only gets worse and worse and worse on an exponential basis over time. And, and I think you're gonna see a, these countervailing forces of increasingly strict data protection regulations and uh, data proliferation 
be an increasing issue <laughs> on this panel and elsewhere over time. Yeah, Google was at the uh, IAPP conference. They were there and they built a cage and uh, it looked like a cage, it did. Um, I posted some pictures of myself and some friends like trying to get out of the Google cage. The big sign everywhere that said Google wants to make you safer. So they're definitely trying to do the Apple thing with like, you know, privacy is cover for anti-competitive behavior. Um, yeah, Apple was there. They, they were pretty, Tim Cook was pretty angry too. Um, but it, it just shows that they're listening, but they're not quite listening to the whole argument, I think. I listened to Max Schrems recently and he said, even Google fonts has identifiers in it. So even the fonts that are used by Google, so IP trackers, that's great. What about Google fonts? Well, you keep going and taking away and nipping away pieces of Google um, and Google has got to make some changes to stay in the market because they keep you know, being left, they're unlawful. So, well, what's the next thing that they're going to do? This looks like some of the introductions of the changes that they're going to make. Are they for the better? I don't know. I think we still have the issue with the FISA court. Um, and addressability. So I think that's going to be the bigger issue instead of some, you know, them not tracking the IP addresses. So um, the next topic is Jeff's, and Jeff's going to talk about scraping data from LinkedIn profiles, and it's legal. The appellate court ruled so this week. Jeff, what are yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, actually, this uh, this case went to the Supreme Court and was uh, pushed back down uh, to the Ninth Circuit after the Supreme Court had made a ruling uh, in Van Buren, which was, uh, which was a court case that uh, the Supreme Court made a ruling uh, about the, uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And this is really sort of a complicated issue. Um, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is essentially a law that was passed uh, quite a while ago to stop people from hacking uh, into computers. Uh, it was really, initially it was a, a, a criminal law and it was later sort of amended to become more uh, of something you could also sue for uh, civil uh, damages. But uh, it essentially says that whoever intentionally accesses a computer without authorization or exceeds uh, authorized access uh, and obtains information from a protected computer, um, if the contact uh, involved, uh, if, it, if it involves interstate or foreign communication, that can be punished. And so obviously there's a lot of legal legalese there. Is it intentional access? Is it authorized or unauthorized? Is it a protected computer? Um, and all of those things make it very complicated as to, to what's actually going on. So now instead of just talking about whether somebody is breaking into a computer, now it, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is being used to stop people from scraping websites, right? Which is really what this, this new case is about. And HiQ Labs scraped a bunch of information from LinkedIn and wanted to reuse it themselves. Um, but the problem in this particular case was they scraped a bunch of personal data, your data and my data, right? About our, you know, about us and about our jobs and our job history and things like that. So the real question is, you know, what does that mean? And in this particular case, the court essentially said, yeah, it's okay for them to scrape all that data because uh, Chris and Heidi and Kat and I made all that data public and LinkedIn didn't really protect it other than telling people, no, 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 you shouldn't access it. So it's okay. Everything's good. Uh, Haiku can do this. Um, that's the ruling. The problem, of course, is that this really says now it's okay to sort of violate data privacy uh, issues, right? And just scrape whatever data, whatever data you want. And that's going to cause some big issues. About the gates, they said because they didn't put the gates up, everybody must want it to be public, right? So making it public doesn't mean you also want it to be scraped and then reused and resold for other purposes. You know, that's not the same thing as a LinkedIn user. That's not what I meant when I set my settings. LinkedIn. <laughs> so to their credit, they have said they're going to do what they can to do more technologically to try to prevent this kind of thing, but the data is already out there. So yeah, yeah I, I was I was surprised that it came down that way as well. What do you guys think? Well, I, I have a personal stake in this because uh, I put a LinkedIn post up about this with a couple of thoughts and opinions, which I, I'm happy to say kicked off a really interesting multi-threaded conversation on LinkedIn. So it all got very meta really quick, but uh, um, 
And uh, so there was a lot of interesting opinions in there that ranged from, you know, uh, isn't this putting sort of the cat amongst the pigeons? Why LinkedIn, you know, they have a vested interest in um, not having data shared because they want all of it. And that was an interesting perspective. And I think not probably not incorrect, but uh, but my perspective was that, you know, let's give credit where it's due, kind of like with Apple, you could always argue that it's good for business. And if privacy is good for business, isn't that a good thing? Like, I I think so. But um, but in the case of LinkedIn, it was like, um, you know, and, and, the, and their parent company, Microsoft, of course, it like, they're on the right side of history here. I mean, they're trying to do the right thing, whatever the reason in terms of giving their members or their users more more control but but the but the real issue i guess from a data ownership perspective which is what i always try to bring to the table is that shouldn't users have uh control over access to their data even within a third-party app like linkedin and if that were the case uh then the consents and uh access controls would be managed by the end user and if that were the case, wouldn't courts find it much more difficult to make a commercial decision on what really is a, a, a decision about privacy and, and human rights? And so I, I guess some fine day, which is exactly the mission of the Data Collaboration Alliance, when users have control of their information, I think courts will make, find it more difficult to make decisions like this based on commercial, not personal reasons. Yeah. I think this is another one of those, just because you can doesn't mean you should because the data is there and it's available. And I've never seen a terms of service that says, hey, if you're a third party using LinkedIn, you know what, you can see the data, but you're not allowed to scrape it and go reuse it. Like we don't we don't have that as LinkedIn members. But this is arguably to me, this is the same as if I'm on a beach in a bathing suit and someone takes a picture, it's a public beach, but does that give them the right to take that picture and then resell it or redistribute it? Um, and it, like, again, it's the context. We're not sharing in that context, but I don't know how you fix it. I can't see a technological way to block people from taking data that's there for sharing. All right, Chris, you're gonna talk about a major study that finds consumers becoming data capitalists willing to trade personal info. Who did that study? The Global Data and Marketing Alliance. <laughs> so I'm not really sure who they are. And I, I brought this story to the table because I thought, you know, we could have some fun with both of what, what it represents, like our, uh, and, and who's behind the study for that very reason. I, I think we, I haven't done a, a close look into who the Global Data Marketing Alliance are, but I think Jeff has, and you can bring that in a second. Um, but the, the thrust of it is that the study was published recently saying that four years after government regulation and media coverage about uh, data self-sovereignty, um, that uh, they've, they've had a material effect on the way people view their data, i.e. Uh, they're much more likely to contribute it to uh, third parties and causes. And, and I think part of the context here was the pandemic and revealing your vaccine status and all that sort of thing in your passport. And uh, I think it's it's an interesting study to be put out. Um, it, for example, it says that um, uh, in 2018, only 26% of respondents to this study characterized themselves as um, deem themselves as data unconcerned, and and, that, and that's now risen to 31% in 2020 to 2022. The, the, the thesis being that, that we're all, thanks to the pandemic and other things in the news, uh, that we're all a bit more willing to share our data. Um, but I think Jeff brought something up in the green room to this meeting. I think I'd uh, hand over to him to, uh, to bring up. Uh, sure, Chris. Um, well, I think the, the headline for me is, is probably that, you know, uh, that data broker uh, says that uh, people more willing to share share data. Um, it, it's not necessarily that, that that this market research is wrong. I think probably within the context of what they're they're uh, exploring, they're probably right um, that people may be more willing to share. But uh, the context that I would use is this: um, the the data pure uh, sorry the data pragmatists and uh, I forget the the uh, the framework that they're using there, but it's essentially the same framework that Alan Weston used, uh, I guess, like 30 or 40 years ago when he originally sort of explored this idea. 
And Alan Weston was a data privacy researcher, uh, really, I guess the first one. Um, and he sort of devised the, the notice and consent framework that we still sort of use today. Um, and he was really a big influencer in the world of privacy. But there were some things wrong with the original research uh, that he did that sort of came to light later uh, in life. And there were some things wrong with his studies. Um, I think that, that beh uh, behavioral economists have sort of figured out. I don't know whether that, that, that those things that were wrong with his studies are wrong with these new ones, but I think it probably needs to be looked at. Um, and I just have some concerns with, with where uh, and how we sort of handle that um, and how we sort of represent those, those three groups, those buckets. Awesome. Kat, did you have anything to add or are you looking forward to this BC commissioner ruling here? Either way. <laughs> yeah, it says the BC commissioner is mulling over privacy code for children. Well, it's got to be good if it's for the children, right? Uh, it should be good. Um, we don't have anything for the children. Uh, the UK just released a privacy code for children, and that was sort of the impetus. So the, um, the US has COPPA, which is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Canada doesn't actually have an equivalent. We have a bunch of hazy language in all of our regulations that sort of say if kids are under 14, you should be getting consent from a parent, but it's not specified. We don't have specifics around how data can be used and abused. Um, so COPPA, for anyone who's unfamiliar, says that children under 13 data cannot be taken, cannot be used. And then between uh, 13 and 17, it can be used, but it has to be aggregated and anonymized. And then over 18, you can use the data. So what's interesting about, um, so BC as a province, which is British Columbia, has its own um, Privacy Protection Act. A lot of the provinces do, uh, again, doesn't cover children. Um, so it's kind of looking to go into that. But one of the things that they're looking at as well is nudging. And if people are unfamiliar with nudging, it is one of the privacy harms where software is built, where the yes is big and easy to see, and the no is somewhere small in the corner, and it drives you to say yes. Um, even, even things in, in the YouTube videos that continue to play, like anything that, that forces you to continue to use something, um, this privacy commissioner is now saying nudging is a specific, and, and it's a harm to all, but it's a specific harm to children. And so they're looking in this privacy code for children to include nudging as a real risk and harm. Um, and so companies wouldn't be able to deploy it or use it as much as they're using it. I think it's fantastic. Behavioral economics has been used against us for so long. It's about time that we figure out how it works and put it into the regulations. Dark patterns are everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, that's I think that's great. Oh, sorry, Jim. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, oh, thanks. I, I was going to just raise the point that I'm glad Kat chose this story because uh, I'm not sure how others feel, but uh, I, I don't feel that my privacy online has been lost to the ages entirely. I mean, I've still got life to live and, and things I'm going to do in the future that I would like to protect and, and have control over. But I think it's right to focus a lot of, um, a lot of the attention uh, in the privacy sector and PrivTech and beyond on children who arguably have their lives ahead of them and or do have their lives ahead of them and all their data to protect. And I, I don't think there, we can do enough uh, to focus on people who are entering the digital world from birth, possibly before birth, if you think about the data collected in the placenta before they're born. Um, uh, and, and, and so I just, I'm, I was pleased to cut chose this story and um, and to highlight that issue. Um, I don't know how others feel about that. A lot of people are like, it's too late for me. My privacy has gone. So let's focus on the kid. I don't believe that. But I believe that equal emphasis needs to be given to children. And they don't always have the same voice that adults do or business people do. I'm very much in agreement with that, Chris. Um, plus, I also think that it's a good way to, to introduce privacy legislation. Um, if you can get it in for, for kids first. Um, it's a way to sort of introduce that type of legislation to the world. And then hopefully you can sort of expand some of that stuff to the broader population. Um, I don't know how well that's going to work, but I think it's a, it's a good start. Um, yeah. I mean, it's hard to get dark pattern stuff uh, into the broader, broader privacy legislation landscape, but getting it in for kids first, I think it's an easier win. Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, and we're not making it up. It's yeah, there's science behind it. It's yeah, it's behavioral economics, right? So yeah. I think this is a pretty good segue into the next story that Jeff has here, which is a new campaign in the UK to rename cookies as data collectors so that you can highlight kids' privacy online. Yeah, exactly. This is really sort of the same kind of a story. Um, and as Kat uh, said before, the UK has been really great with, uh, with the new children's code. Uh, they're probably strongest right now uh, on protecting kids uh, mm -hmm. for data privacy. Uh, they've done some excellent work there. And this is another step uh, in, in that kind of action. Uh, I'm really uh, pretty impressed with that. They're also doing some really good stuff with AI um, and, and children's code. Uh, which is pretty amazing. But in terms of uh, this uh, idea for renaming cookies as data collectors, I've been a sort of a big proponent of this um, uh, on a broader scale. And so I really love the idea of going after it uh, in the children's venue first, because I think it's, like I said, a first step, right? And it could actually uh, happen here. Uh, because uh, the idea of calling these trackers cookies is, uh, is an, a misnomer, and I think it's why they're so widely accepted, right? Uh, will, you, will you take these cookies um, and all this cookie consent stuff? It sounds like it's a, a benign practice, but it's not. It's, it's will you allow tracking to happen? Um, and it's just a crazy thing that, that we're, we're allowing people to do. It's almost uh, you know, akin to the whole idea of having privacy policies or privacy notices uh, for websites when those privacy notices aren't really about privacy. It's about telling you all the different things they're going to do to track you. They're rarely ever telling you about how much privacy you have, right? It's, it's the exact opposite. And, and cookies aren't about, you know, giving you anything good. They're about all the things that they're going to do to surveil you. So why are we giving them nice names instead of uh, what, calling them what they are? Yeah, well, I've, done, I've done a lot of work with um, with kids around, I used to call it digital safety, now I call it online reputation, because kids, it's not about safety, it's about what they're putting online and what they're sharing. And I think there's a broad misunderstanding around kids and people say, well, they have all these public Instagram accounts and public TikTok accounts, so they don't care about privacy. Uh, they do care about privacy. What they have is a lack of understanding of who has access to their information. So exactly what Jeff said, it's the tracking they don't like. Um, when a when a young teenage girl sticks up an Instagram account with a bunch of bikini shots, it's not because she wants everyone to see the shots. It's because she has like 10 people in mind who she's hoping will actually look at her account. Um, I often tell parents that if their teenage daughters are doing that to have a middle-aged friend, just be like, hey, saw your photo, great bikini. Um, and that gets that photo down really quickly. So <laughs> I, <laughs> like kids, are, again, they they aren't thinking of the reach. It's not that they, they, they care that other people can see their stuff. So I love this. I love the fact that they're changing the name. Kids don't want to be tracked. They just want to be able to share what they want to share with the, the group of people that they want to share it with. I, I hate data brokers. I call them data brokers. I tell my children about data brokers. My kids understand everything about it. We were playing Clue. And that's how I taught them to play Clue is by explaining relational data to them. And after we had the discussion of relational data, they whipped me pretty quick at Clue. So I kind of had that coming. Uh, but it's <laughs> good to talk to your kids about these things to find these kinds of examples. So, and I'm not the only one. Uh, Professor Solov just published his paper um, this week. And he also talks about the example of Clue and relational data. So it's important to talk about kids about what's happening online because you're not doing it with a machine. There are other people on the other side of machine and what are those people doing? So it's it's all about raising the awareness and yeah, call it like it is. Data collectors, data brokers. I got a couple of names that aren't fit for podcasts, but Chris, you got something to say about it? Uh, yes, uh, those are all excellent points and it was a nice uh, continuation from the previous story around children. Um, I, I lived in the UK for a long time and I'm surprised they, they weren't called you know, uh, biscuits instead of cookies anyway, because <laughs> that's their name for cookies. Um, but um, it's it's just another signpost in the in what I hope is the beginning and the end for the cookie entirely. Uh, first of all, like this story reveals, like in this, let's call them what they are, which is data collectors and surveillers. And then secondly, let's you know, I think similar to Google Analytics in our previous story brought up, it's like the cookie's been having a pretty quiet existence for a few decades now, and you know, not too much, not not many months go by without um, 
you know, a review of these little pieces of software goes by and, and then it's a sort of fundamental rethink of what they mean to privacy and what they mean to society wider and particularly children. So I think it's a great move. Um, I hope others follow suit. And um, I'm ex interested to see the, the future of the cookie as um, uh, data collection and data aggregation and just the entire landscape seems to be in upheaval right now for, in a good way. And uh, the cookie could be just another victim alongside uh, Google Analytics before we know it. So we've got one more story to talk about here. Um, kind of seems pretty obvious here, but your personal data is exposed to hackers and it's an alarming report revealing that your mobile apps are not protecting your info. So I, I don't know who really thought that was happening, but yeah, what do you guys have to say about that? Awesome. I think the thrust of the story was that uh, there's no malware or anything that you need to sideload, download, or engage with for hackers to get at your phone data. They can simply do it through the browser. And uh, I, I suppose this is a you know what another one of those stories that uh, is nothing sacred. Well, not really. Uh, and so it's. Um, it just continues to speak about the need for humanity, society to move towards a, a, an end game where there's less data, it's used with intent. The owners of information or the rightful owner information have, have control of it. And there's far less third party data collection than there is today, which is a hallmark of web 2.0 because, you know, as it turns out, you, you can't even access the web um, at all without being surveilled or, or hacked or life hacked in some way. And the, the other thing like to our other story I, I read about just recently about the screen scraping associated with LinkedIn is that most screen scraping takes place on the, on the, the web page logs. And so it goes completely undetected. So if I scrape LinkedIn, they can detect that and bring it into, into the realm of a court case. But in fact, uh, most screen scraping takes place on Google's uh, page logs, which nobody looks at <laughs> except people trying to scrape data. So this is a, essentially a cache of, of web pages. And so um, I, I thought I'd just bring that up at this point in the nothing, nothing sacred sort of uh, file in the browser that um, you know it's interesting and, and sad in a way as well that um, it's so easy. <laughs> I guess. It's you so want to talk about side loading? Anybody want to talk about side loading? Jeff, you had something to say? No, uh, not really on side loading. <laughs> um, I have a comment, but I, I forgot what it was there when you, you said side loading. Oh, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> he said, Chris said side loading. I was like, maybe we should take did, a yes. and talk to people what side loading is. <laughs> yeah, right. We're going to talk to people and tell them what side loading is for people that don't know what side loading is. Uh, sure, it's it's the ability to download an app to your phone outside of the walled garden of an app store like uh, the the Apple App Store or Google Play or so um, you know. There's that's a whole different subject and kettle of fish as they say, but um, but I guess the point is most people would associate that activity with being a security risk to the information you have on your mobile computing device. Uh, versus just simply opening a browser. But as it turns out, just simply opening a browser from your phone is enough to expose a lot of information to the uh, well-motivated hacker, put it that way. Um, and it's disturbing. And uh, and I don't know enough about this specific story to know what the answer to that is. Um, browsers are the portal to the web or the internet. <laughs> so I don't see any replacement to the browser imminent. Possibly some of the newer browsers offer more protection and this story is more related to Chrome. I'm not sure. Yeah. Jeff, you want to, you had something? I did want to say one thing. Um, as we're moving away from this sort of third-party data collection, um, as, as Apple and Google try to sort of cut off the third-party data collection, um, and we move more to a, a first-party data collection model where brands, for instance, are collecting the data more directly, uh, there's already a lot of move for, for these brands to start doing things like uh, browser fingerprinting um, and other kinds of ways to, to collect that data, deep data about you more directly uh, through exactly what Chris is talking about, right? 
directly grabbing the data through the mobile operating system or your desktop operating system directly um, and trying to figure out exactly who you are because Google and Apple won't tell, tell them that information. Uh, and those are sort of nefarious ways to collect that information. And, and there's evidence that that's happening on something like 60 or 80% of websites already when you visit them. So I'm finding this fun, funny from my perspective because it's come full circle. So I worked at BlackBerry, which was RIM. Um, I was leading the architecture team for handheld and we literally designed it so that the operating system would not allow downloadable apps to take your data. That was the whole premise of how we'd done it. Uh, which is also why we lost market share because iPhone came out and you could download all this cool stuff and it just worked. It just connected with your contacts. It just connected with your calendar and it just worked, which was, this is always like my origin story. So people had, how did you get into privacy? And I'm like, because I realized people didn't understand privacy when they jumped ship to <laughs> iPhone. Um, but now we've come back. Now they're locking it down again. Now they're saying, no, every time you download enough, you have to actually consent to have the data pull out of our native apps. Um, but it's it's just interesting to me that that people didn't realize that that didn't realize that having the data available meant having the data available. <laughs> like it was the correlation wasn't there. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, people are lazy, man. And um, yeah, it's it, right. People are lazy. I just want it to work, right? Yeah. So, well, Tim Cook had some interesting things to say about side loading, but first he decided to you know tell us all the positive things about you know what Apple's doing for privacy. Um, and then he went off on the side loading rant um, and it was heated. Like he took us to church for a minute. It was wild. And people in the room loved it for some reason, you know, yell at me some more or whatever. Um, and the whole time I'm sitting there thinking like, does anybody else know that this is just rampant cover for anti-competitive behavior? Because there are technological ways that he can still provide the same safety and security and privacy controls with side loading, you know? Like it's not an all or nothing kind of thing here. I thought you were in the, the process of like building tools and making tools better. So how about do things that we want? We just want them to work and we don't want to be tracked and surveilled and harassed and hacked. So yeah, I, I thought that was that was an interesting way to go about it. And no, I don't trust my phone a bit. It's listening to me right now. It's going to tell all kinds of people what we talked about here today, whether I want it to or not, I'm pretty sure, right? So that's just where I am on the level of trust with, with all of the technologies. I don't trust any of it. I'm zero trust. Well, if I could put my DCA hat back on, um, I would say that you know the, the fundament, the root cause of all this is a lack of data control from end users and developers alike, uh, part, due in part to copies and everything else and copy-based data integration. So the, the, the real solution to get to the root cause is we have to build apps different. And, and, and that's a big part of what we're trying to do at the Data Collaboration Alliance is make people more aware that there are new ways and it's not only decentralized apps and blockchain, there are other technologies that are making this possible to rewire how we build apps, to decouple data from the code. Like that, that's a, a really fundamental principle of uh, the framework we're advancing in, in Canada uh, that's soon to become a national standard called zero copy integration. And, uh, you know, just, a little, a little shout out there for one of Ooh, one of our causes, yay. but <laughs> but we're always we're going to be having this conversation twenty years from now, unless we you know call it Web three, call it Web whatever, or the future of apps. But the 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 real issue underlying all of this is the root cause of how we've combined apps and data, and and every app creates a, a data silo, and those silos need to be connected, and they're connected by copies, and copies equal chaos when all we want is control. And another, I, I always sort of uh, equate privacy to control and I use them fairly interchangeably. What I want is control over who, what, when, where, why sees my data. And I want that as an organization, I want it as an individual. Today's app architecture will never really fully support that. So something to think about. Access not copies. Access not copies are That's hashtag. right. That's right. right. Did anybody screen. have any last points to make before we wrap it up? Awesome. Well, this has been great. It's been lovely to see everybody. And thanks for joining the panel. And that's a wrap, everyone. Thanks again to our guest, Kat Code of Binary Tattoo, Jeff Jokish of Privacy Plan, and Chris McClellan.
of the Data Collaboration Alliance. I'd also like to invite listeners to check out the free community at the Data Collaboration Alliance. We're a vibrant group of data savvy professionals who collaborate on open data sets and build free tools for important causes. It's all done within a zero copy environment that offers our members unprecedented control of their information. Our new community experience is launching soon, so sign up and become a founding member today. Visit datacollaboration.org. The Data Drop is a production of the Data Collaboration Alliance, a nonprofit dedicated to advancing meaningful data ownership and global collaborative intelligence. Data Drop viewers are invited to check out our free community where members collaborate on data sets, dashboards, and open tools in support of important causes. Visit datacollaboration.org.